Doug, would you like to comment before we start uh, asking audience to ask questions? Um, well, you'd have to restate again for me the, so she got 700 plus total. And what was the last, there's so many factors that go into this finding that, what was the last treatment that the patient got? How much? The last one was 200 millicuries. All right, and then, so the ones, the follow-up scan showed absence of uptake in the MET and the calvarium or the brain, whatever it was. The calvarium uptake disappeared the, after the first round. Oh, okay. Remaining, so, remained uh, uh, basically unchanged. So and prior, so prior to the 250-ish, what was happening to our disease? I assume it was progression in size correct. and or TG. Correct. And then she got the 250 and then what were the metrics used and followed and what happened to them? We, we, we uh, routinely followed them with tyroglobulin, stimulated tyroglobulin and uh, in her case, FDG plus radioactive iodine. And another interesting point, uh, at some point she received I-123 imaging with 10 millicuries. Back then we were able to do 10 millicuries. Uh, <laughs> we had 10 millicuries capsules. And uh, something that I observed in another patient, that I-123 scan was negative. When uh, the subsequent I-131 scan showed um, uptake. So there is something about the I-123 scan uh, Dr. Goldsmith made a uh, comment recently about the um, attenuation, uh, the I-123's uh, su uh, subject, I-123 scan, he said, is maybe subject to more attenuation than uh, I-131, but that's also, uh, that's also is another uh, discussion point. And, and another factor with I-123 is that you're imaging typically at 24 hours, some places images at six. Correct. And whereas I-131, many are imaging at 48 to 72, so you have more background clearance and you get better contrast. So after the 250, there was, uh, by whatever metric, progression, was there any improvement in any of the metrics after the 250? After each treatment, there was a drop in thyroglobulin. For how long? Uh, less than three months. Okay, well, that's really not very good. So I think the likelihood that this person's going to get any further response from the from another I-131, and I the 250, I assume, was determined by dosimetry. Correct. Is um, highly unlikely. So at that point, I think it's, and weighing everything, it's reasonable to consider that patient as a high likelihood of radioiodine refractory. Now, the dilemma is what's the next step? So was, was the patient BRAF positive? No, it's a RAS positive tumor. BRAF and RAS tumors. Are, well, that was in uh, the first step. Yes, so, mutually exclusive. So that really even makes the likelihood of uh, a trametinib uh, daprofenib, selumetinib uh, treatment to uh, redifferentiate, quote unquote, unlikely. So it, I think it's reasonable at that point to consider TKI, et cetera. Yeah. But I mean, uh, the, the reason I presented this is like visually, uh, as a very uh, nice uh, uptake, it's a highly radioactive iodine avid tumor, but yet, uh, the, uh, you can't put in, put in enough radiation dose despite the MTA. And that's my definition of radioactive iodine resistance. I forgot to mention also she received uh, external beam radiation treatment, which only had uh, uh, limited benefit. But then again, that radiation treatment was given for palliative purposes, not uh, in the curative context. She did not receive high enough external beam which complicates the definition of uh, the the, uh, the picture. Would you qualify this tumor as radioactive iodine resistant? It's refractory by definition, no doubt. Yeah, uh, yeah. But is it radioactive iodine resistant? Is it radioactive iodine indifferent? No, it's not indifferent. It's avid. It's refractory. It probably is resistant. 
the, yeah. the reason, again, I presented this is to make the distinction between these three concepts. Yeah, and you and I have had this discussion before, and I think it's very good. And I think this substantiates one of the caveats in my second presentation was just because there's radio iodine uptake and it's avid doesn't mean you're going to get a therapeutic response. Yes, right. Dr. Luster, Dr. Greenspan, audience, any questions or comments? I have a question. Yeah, just, just a quick comment. Um, I wonder what uh, the right parameter would be to follow this patient. I mean, um, TG probably not ideal, uh, uptake not ideal. So is this a patient who would really qualify for, for a persist or resist evaluation? And when would you really jump in with uh, TKIs? How would you monitor the dynamics? That's another good question. Um, she is uh, asymptomatic, uh, has a good performance status, and knowing the uh, potential side effects of TKIs in the long run, uh, one is rather hesitant to initiate the TKI. There's no progression, fast progression of disease, but I would... Uh, as a skeptic, I would call this persistent disease, not stable disease. There's a difference in uh, the tone of how you describe the disease. Um, I don't think it's stable, but it is persistent. Would you start TKI now or would you wait a little longer? That's the question. Well, if I can jump in for a minute, I think that's a very important point. And I, again, in my comment, I'm assuming there's evidence of progression. And we are, we are very... Uh, I don't want to use this word twice, but I guess I am. We're very active in doing active surveillance in patients with even known pulmonary METs, but with stable disease on CT. And even if they have I-131 uptake, we will follow them. And we have multiple patients, not dozens and dozens, but we definitely have uh, quite a few patients that we've followed for many years with known pulmonary mets, stable size, radioiodine uptake, and did no treatment. My favorite one has gone eight years with no progression, and then all of a sudden, it, it's as if there's something that changes within that cancer cell. The TG remained flat. The doubling time was basically zero. Um, <clears throat> uptake present, size on CT, stable, and all of a sudden, there was a distinct change and the doubling time started to increase and the size started to increase. So I agree that in selected patients, active surveillance paradoxically may be the appropriate thing despite radioiodine uptake and uh, measurable metrics. The difficulty for us as a group at Washington Hospital Center is when the TG starts going up, and the lesion starts, lesions start to increase in size, none of us know when do you intervene with I-131. Uh, and we don't know that. And there's a reflex, general reflex to do it sooner than later. Well, there's even a movement in, with lenvetinib to consider uh, looking in at pulmonary metastasis, perhaps you should start treating earlier with a TKI, I'm not saying I support this or don't support this, I think we need more data, but that starting earlier may uh, improve the outcome. I'm reminded of a famous statement that Henry Wagner made. Um, and he, when he started doing brain scans, they found out that the patients were living longer, quote unquote, but in reality, they weren't living any longer, they were being diagnosed earlier. So it looked like time from diagnosis to time to passing extended, but it wasn't because the patient lived any longer. They were just diagnosed earlier in their, in in their process. So it's really a difficult area, and I welcome any suggestions because it's, it's a frequent problem in our MedStar Washington Hospital Center practice. If I may uh, comment on that, um, just to give the audience an idea, how we manage those patients. Usually we start monitoring uh, quite frequently using FTG, PET-CT, and we look uh, 
for new lesions, of course, and we look for the size of the lesions in the lung or bone. And we do that at the three to four month interval at the beginning. And once we're getting an idea of the dynamics uh, of, of the disease, we stretch the interval to six or nine months if the patient remains more or less uh, stable. So in the beginning, we tend to, to, if we see the patient first time and he or she is already metastasized, we would do an FTG pad followed by a second one three months later, and then uh, uh, stretch the intervals. That's our strategy. How do you, Marcus, how do you decide when to intervene? What's, what's the metrics and the level of the metric? I think this is not only uh, uh, related to, to the metrics, it's also the patient, um, like a minimalist or the maxima, maximalist approach. It's the age of course, it's the overall performance status of the patient. There are so many aspects you need to consider and it's always an individualized discussion, but as you already alluded to, we have to keep in mind that there are data that you should uh, start earlier. Um, so it's always individual. Agreed. I think we have a, a question in the chat box. Um, Deidre, can you uh, read the question, please? Yes, I can. The question in the chat is, what sorts of side effects did this patient present with after being treated with such a high total dose? So I, uh, I take this question is uh, directed to me. Uh, the patient's treatments were done with max, uh, maximum tolerated activity dosimetry. Um, she did not have any bone marrow associated side effects. Uh, interestingly enough, she is not even symptomatic. Most patients even receiving a moderate dose of radioactive iodine, they, uh, they get some degree of uh, serostomia she doesn't have xerostomia uh, either. Uh, I should say it was well tolerated uh, with no adverse uh, outcomes. There are a couple of questions I was told in Q&A. Um, the first one, how is the TG level doubling time in this patient? TG, TG level actually was uh, uh, fluctuating. It, it wasn't a consistent uh, elevation or decrease uh, that is um, that correlated with the uh, radiologic findings. There was no uh, quantitative measure that uh, correlated with the TG changes. When there was a drop in TG, there was not an associated uh, decrease, significant decrease in radioactive iodine uptake or FDG uptake and vice versa. Again, my interpretation of that is uh, thyroglobulin, radioactive iodine and FDG represent different aspects of uh, thyroid differentiation. In general, uh, they have thyroglobulin and radioactive iodine have reasonably uh, linear correlation and reasonably inverse linear correlation with FDG versus radioactive iodine, but not always. All right, the last question in the Q&A is, in a de novo post-op patient, normal USG, elevated TSH, negative TGAB, do you perform FDG PET scan if TG is elevated? If so, at what level? If this, well, uh, we all have to answer this question separately. My answer is no. Uh, if it, it's a normal ultrasound after uh, surgery, it, uh, there is not a normal ultrasound, but an expected uh, a negative ultrasound. Elevated TSH is what you want uh, when you uh, want to decide uh, if you're going to give radioactive iodine, proceed with radioactive iodine. Negative thyroglobulin antibody indicates that uh, the thyroglobulin level is reasonably, uh, more than reasonably, uh, is an indicator of, uh, of uh, functioning 
thyroid tissue volume. Now, elevated thy uh, thyroglobulin is an indicator of residual disease if you have a negative post-treatment scan or, it, uh, or a radioactive iodine scan, then this proportional, uh, uh, this proportional elevated thyroglobulin uh, may indicate a radioactive iodine indifferent uh, tumor. Otherwise, uh, thyroglobulin simply correlates with the functioning volume, which could well be, which could well be a uh, thyroid remnant. And it depends on where the operation is performed or the uh, operating surgeon was. Uh, we see a wide uh, range of thyroglobulin levels, especially uh, in those patients treated in the community uh, with varying levels of uh, surgical expertise. What was the question again? <laughs> in a de novo, post-op patient, normal or negative ultrasound, elevated TSH, negative thyroglobulin antibody, would you perform FDG PET scan if thyroglobulin is elevated? And if so, at what level? And this is pre-surgical? No. This is post-surgical. Surgical. And, and they had a new already... patient, de novo patient, new patient, uh, shortly after surgery, uh, based on the elevated TSH, I would say it's probably four to six weeks after surgery. Well, in patients with total thyroidectomy. Okay. I would not normally, and we do not normally perform an FDG if I heard the patient described correctly. Uh, and I have to admit, there is also other factors. There's no reimbursement. <laughs> and I'm aware of, and that's the reality of life. And so in our hospital setting, if we routinely did that in those patients, we would have definite administrative pushback. Uh, this is more of a scientific question uh, to, to uh, validate the, the role of a, an important imaging modality. So yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, in our clinical practice in the US, uh, that's a major limitation. Uh, but if you could do, would you have done it? That is the question. Well, Ben, you are a key leader and we're on the AUC. Right. I don't, you know, I was with you, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Did they have a statement regarding uh, the appropriate use of PET FDG in such a patient? Uh, I'd have to look it up to be precise, but I'm pretty sure that they would say, no, it's not indicated at this point. It's, it's rarely appropriate. Uh, particularly, I, I would uh, want to see the level of the TSH. Uh, I would hope it's over 30, and then I would use I-131 for imaging. And unless that was absolutely negative, I, I wouldn't uh, proceed to FDG PET at that point. But certainly not before you do an I-131 study. It's not, it's not appropriate to use FDG. Would you do a, a diagnostic radioactive iodine scan before you treat this patient? I, I would. I, I happen to like those, even though they're not as sensitive as the post-therapy scan. Uh, I, I do find that it's, it's useful in some cases. But I know there's a lot of controversy about that. A, a number of colleagues say that they get no added in information and it doesn't change management. Uh, and in my view, I think it adds information. But how, uh, that's how, do, you do, how do you deal with the logistics? So do you do your uh, imaging and therapy with um, uh, recombinant human TSH or withdrawal? Uh, Johnny with withdrawal. Okay, so then that poses less of a problem than um, recombinant human TSH. Yeah, have Probably uh, I should give the... the, the the European perspective to make the picture complete. Please do. Um, usually, <laughs> usually, we would not go for an FDG uh, PET CT in the situation uh, that was described. Um, I would base my decision on a single TG level, but probably follow the course of the disease. In our hands, the goal would still be to have a negative or undetectable. 
uh, TG in most of the cases. And in, in a very small patient group, we don't achieve this goal. And um, in this uh, patient sample, we would just go for one FDG uh, uh, PET-CT to rule out uh, either negative metastasis after they had an iodine scan, of course. But that's a minority of patients. And coming to the question, uh, we don't care about uh, the TG level in this case. We just want to exclude uh, radioiodine negative uh, disease. And we do it once, and usually it's negative. Mm -hmm. There's another question from the audience. How about pretreatment with a chemotherapeutic uh, radio sensitizer? This uh, is another topic we uh, discussed think, over daiquiris. It's, it's a great question. And I think, and um, I have a talk tomorrow afternoon. And in that, <clears throat> I like your phrase, thinking differently. And I think we need to move more in the direction of thinking differently. How do we increase RAD delivered per millicurie administered. We always talk about administered activity, more administered activity or less. But, and I, I think this is very important if we can find radio sensitizers to change or uh, these indifferent or thyroid cancers that are not sensitive to radiation. Unfortunately, I don't think we have any clear cut chemotherapeutic radio sensitizer in the sense of increasing the sensitivity of the cell to the radiation. We certainly are seeing trametinib and daprofenib, but as you pointed out, Cesar, that's working in a different mechanism of getting more iodine in. That's not increasing the effect per millicurie administered, but we should be thinking in that direction. It's a great question, and I'm happy to hear anybody that's doing some work in that area. Right. Another okay. question. Oh, uh, we have to keep in mind, Doug, that uh, the the trial in the ablation or adjuvant setting was negative, of course. So, um, in the case uh, of of uh, um, just first uh, attempt to to give radioactive iodine, it didn't help the patient at all. So you need to be sure that you're dealing with a radioiodine resistant or uh, at least refractory disease. That's an excellent point. I mean, I, yeah. I know that trial, the, the, the trial is known as Astra trial, and uh, it, it was initiated in 2013. At the time, uh, the differences between BRAF versus RAS tumors were not known, and the response to MEC treatment in these two groups are different. Because if you uh, block MAC, there's a feedback inhibition of BRAF. So it responds uh, better in RAS group than BRAF group. In a mut mutated BRAF tumor, uh, the inhibition of BRAF uh, negatively by ERK is not possible. So all comers, there was no difference and the trial was a failure. But now this is a, a trial by Memorial Group. They're looking at the subsets and they're identifying that the RAS group has better, ref, uh, has better responses. Everything boils down to dissecting the tumor more uh, and identifying the, the mechanisms of uh, indifference and levels of indifference. The other question is, how do you approach a patient with high thyroglobulin antibodies in a, uh, in a setting uh, where the whole, uh, whole body scan is negative. Negative whole body scan, high thyroglobulin antibody. What's the reliability of that scan? Well, I'll, I can lead off on that. The reliability isn't that good, uh, but we run into this a lot. It's a TG positive scan, negative patient. And uh, Ted Silberstein has a, uh, term this a tennis syndrome, TG positive, scan negative. And <clears throat> I think the s &M guidelines um, will address this. And again, Dr. Silberstein has been a big speaker and advocate on this. And there's really several steps. So you want to try to, the negative whole body scan is negative. Um, 
you want to try to identify the source of the TG. I don't know what high means because that can make a difference. But one way to look at this is that there's additional imaging to be performed and there's three levels. So one should consider, again, I'm not saying drink Pepsi or drink Coca-Cola, but should consider uh, doing a further evaluation with CT, chest X-ray. I would do a contrast CT, um, FDG PET, uh, in some of our facilities when the, or endocrinologists, when the TG is very high and despite no neurological symptoms, in the first level, they will do a, uh, an MRI of the head. Uh, certainly in our second step group, I think that's a reasonable option. But so I, I'd work them up. I'd repeat ultrasound of the neck. I do a contrast CT. I do an FDG PET CT. Um, and then, in, and they're stepwise, so we wouldn't do all of them. We'll do them sequentially, because if we identify it earlier, we may or may not want to stop with additional imaging. And then in a second tier level, <clears throat> one of the, uh, that could be a brain MRI. Uh, and what we've done, and we actually had a prospective study running, that when the patient was negative by all conventional imaging, radioiodine scan, ultrasound, CT, um, Pat, I'm forgetting something else in there. Uh, we would even consider doing a the old Sestamibi scan. And for, for those with most of us having gray hair or no hair, we'll remember that in the 80s and 90s, Sestamibi was a fairly good agent, not, not great, but fairly good in detecting a differentiated thyroid cancer and FDG re replaced that. So we set up a prospective study that when all conventional imaging was complete in step one, then we would consider a Sestamibi. Now we didn't complete that study because of gathering enough patients, but our very first patient lit up on the Sestamibi, negative iodine, negative PET, negative everything. Although the PET, the FDG PET in fairness, did not image uh, the brain area. Uh, we stopped. Uh, before we got to that, but we identified with a Sestamibi and a bone scan was negative. The Sestamibi scan identified a focal area in the occipital calvarium uh, that was ultimately resected. Uh, we did a CT of that area and there was a lytic lesion. It was resected. It was differentiated thyroid cancer. So to come back to the question, I would do additional imaging. I try to look at level one, two, and three, level one being conventional, Level two, looking at maybe brain MR, uh, Sestamibi scan, and level three, possibly, but it's expensive, the yield is low, is to look at the somatostatin imaging because occasionally some of these patients can be somatostatin positive and now gallium-67 dotatate positive and maybe treated with lutetium. But I would, so I, I think it's a spectrum of trying to evaluate further uh, and then deciding to follow if it will declare itself. But I welcome uh, others' uh, suggestion on trying to manage that tennis patient. If there are so occasional they, cases where gallium 68 dota tate actually does uh, provide. Yeah, I meant 68, not 67. That's my oldness. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point, we, we have to remind that officially the session is over and we have to make an executive decision whether to continue or. Uh, or not? Well, it depends upon what you're serving for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you not get the code? If you have the code, you can order Papa John's for free. May I comment on the question on the TG antibody level? Please. Just just um, to provide my my perspective. Um, I think if the only pathological finding would be elevated TG antibodies in the presence of a negative scan, um, you may as well use these antibodies as a surrogate marker for therapy response. So usually they would disappear or at least decrease over the course of time. And um, if TG itself is not reliable, just measure TG antibodies and usually it would, they would go down and disappear over the course of one, two years. And there's studies out there showing this. So um, it wouldn't make me that nervous. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I have actually one more question. Well, one more person with three questions. <laughs> uh, do you recommend uh, routinely performing diagnostic whole body scan prior to radioactive iodine therapy uh, in the post-operative setting? If so, what protocol? And two, uh, do you have a standardized protocol to decide what dose dosage of radioactive iodine to, to use? And what do you think about 30 millicuries? So essentially, let me summarize this. Uh, do you do preoperative or postoperative pre-treatment scan? And uh, what do you use? Do you prefer using 30 millicuries over a higher dose for ablation purposes? Okay. Is, this the topic, is this the topic for uh, 2022? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, it probably will be. This, this could take all of lunch. But maybe we take a vote because it's going to be controversial. Okay, just just, just uh, give a short answer. Do you like 30 or, or not? Yes or no? I do not use 30 millicuries for uh, routine scanning, if that was the question. No, not I for do. routine scanning, for uh, remnant ablation. For remnant ablation at our facility, and this is very controversial and very different in across the U.S. Not a yes and no answer. We perform in every patient we're considering for I-131 treatment, we will do a diagnostic scan. And for remnant ablation, we usually, and remnant ablation as has been defined by the ATA and Martinique group is just destroying normal tissue, not to reduce recurrence, but to follow up TG we will use 30 to 50 millicuries. What's your success rate with 30? Well, I haven't gone back to check that, but the Schlumberger and Malik, which looked at 30 versus 100, they were getting 85% sex rate, and that's still not 100%. So there's an argument to go with a higher amount of activity, and that's been one of the controversies we've been discussing in the S&M uh, 2021 guidelines. Marcus, diagnostic scan, yes, no. 30 millicuries for ablation, yes, no. We don't do a diagnostic scan prior to adjuvant therapy. And since we stick to the protocol or the idea of adjuvant, we would go for more than 30, suddenly. More than 30 or 30? More than 30. Which is what, 31 or 100? <laughs> 50 to 100, usually 100. Okay, Ben. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, pre scan, yes or no? 30, yes or no? Uh, Pre-treatment scan, I, yes, I like to do those. Uh, uh, as far as ablation, remnant ablation, I'm concerned that 30 millicuries may not be enough in a significant number of patients. So I would use more. I'm, I'm uh, used What's to using- more, 31 or under than 100? More like 100, but that's, uh, that's frowned upon lately, uh, according to some people who are discussing the, the guidelines. So. I guess 50 to 100 is probably a reasonable range. Yeah. But I think that's been the been most significant time. that's been the most significant controversy. I don't want to talk behind <laughs> of things right. behind the curtain. The most significant controversy in the uh, discussion of the SNMI part of the guidelines. That's right. The part of the group favoring the recommendation being 30 to 100 and the other group 30 to 50. But but I'm indifferent <laughs> and I am resistant to give 30. I, give I understand 100. that. And I've actually argued your case in that group for you. Okay. Well, this was a lovely session. Thank you all very much. I think we're just a uh, few minutes over, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, Ten. 10 minutes over. That's uh, not all that bad. Uh, thank you all very much for participating. Uh, we'll reconvene at one o'clock to discuss molecular pathology, molecular cytology with Yuri Nikiforov and, uh, uh, and Marina Nikiforova. Uh, they are uh, big in the world of uh, molecular pathology. Until then, goodbye now. <laughs>